Hello, everybody. Welcome to True Food TV. I'm Nicole Jolly, and we have a really special treat today. We are taking your gardening questions with a rock star garden expert who has been advising me this whole garden season as I've made my home gardening series that I hope you've been following along with. Her name is Shani McCabe. You might have heard me mention her name throughout the series. She is a horticulturist at Baker Creek Heirloom Seed, which is our partner on that home gardening series. And I'm gonna bring her in now. Shani, are you here? Hi, Shani. I'm here. <laughs> Hi, welcome. I'm gonna tell everybody a little bit about your background um, and then we'll take some questions and we'll also be talking today about how to transition your garden from one season to the next, because a lot of us are in the middle of doing that right now. Um, yeah, <laughs> and we, we've got lots of live people joining us. We'll take your questions. We've also received some questions in advance. So we'll just take it one at a time. <laughs> so Excited. yeah, great. Thank you for joining us. Um, so everybody, Shani is, has been a horticulturist for over a decade with a focus on sustainable agriculture. She has worked on organic vegetable and flower farms all over the country. Also some landscaping and nursery work. For the past six years, she's been with Baker Creek. And if you have received their seed catalog, which is truly a thing of beauty. <laughs> That's her handiwork. She writes that entire seed catalog and I've had it on good authority that this coming catalog is gonna be the biggest one ever, like 500 pages or something like absolutely insane. But the point is, is that Shani has actually tasted every single variety that she writes about that's in that. She's grown all of those varieties. So she is just steeped, right, in all of this, <laughs> all of this information. Um, so, so yeah, she is a wealth of information. She joins us today from her home state of Rhode Island. However, she now lives in central Florida, which means that all of you gardeners out there who live in a hot and humid climate, she can take your questions. I should also mention though, and I'll let Shani talk in a minute. <laughs> I should also mention that Shani has experience growing in all of the zones. So um, don't worry, we can try to tackle anything that you're encountering. We'll do our best um, to, to get you sorted out. Um, we'll start by taking some questions, Shani, and then we'll talk a little bit about garden transitions. So that sound good? Yeah, I love it. Okay, great. All right, so hello everybody. I'm just looking at the comments now coming in. Um, uh, wow, okay, welcome, welcome all. I see some familiar faces and some new ones. Um, I am going to start with a question that came in early on. Um, Baker Creek did, I think, a, or you guys did a recent video about um, Chinese uh, celosia, is that right? Is there another name for that? Yeah, Chinese wool flower, that's the there. name. Okay, and so um, uh, this commenter asks, um, where can she get, or he, get some of those seeds? Um, yeah, so we've been working to resurrect and bring back Chinese wool flower. So it will, um, with luck, and I, I'm feeling fairly confident at this point, it will be available in the 2021 um, catalog or on our website, rareseeds.com. So just check in the flowers section and you should be able to find that amazing flower. So that there is something really special about that flower, right? You said resurrect. Is that what, what you said? Yeah, it was a popular variety, um, I believe, during the Victorian era, and it had since um, fallen out of it had fallen out of popularity, which is stunning because it's a very easy to grow. Uh, it's a great drought tolerant, heat tolerant flower that can just bring a punch of you know fireworks of color to your garden with relative care uh, like ease of care and it, it it fell into obscurity and uh you really couldn't find the seeds around and so they've kind of been brought out from obscurity and now we're making them available through um extensive growing growing out we've been um, increasing the seed stock to make available so bringing it back great and, and we'll talk a little bit about 
your work, um, your handle is actually uh, Seed Scavenger. So I know you have a lot of experience, um, you know, discovering or uncovering seeds from around the world. So we'll talk about that work a little later on because it's really important stuff. I'm gonna turn back to questions. Um, Miss Magnolia Sugar says, I want to know how important is isolation when it comes to saving seed, particularly when you grow multiple varieties of the same type of plant. Are they even worth collecting if they have crossed? Ah, good question. Um, isolation is important depending on the crop. Now, there's a before I even get into my own suggestions, I need to recommend a book. It's called Seed to Seed by Suzanne Ashworth and a few, actually it's a, it's a few authors work together, but the book is called Seed to Seed. Also, Seed Savers Exchange has a really great um, kind of encyclopedia on seed saving. There you will find kind of the authoritative information on seed saving and isolation distance um, and techniques of that manner. But um, for practical this year gardening purposes, say I have 10 types of marigolds in my garden, um, I'm not super uptight about having a crossed marigold. And I, in fact, wouldn't mind seeing um, a funky little cross of marigolds. So I'm going to, for example, save my marigold seeds this season, even if I have 10 varieties growing. And the cross isn't going to bother me too much. Um, so the answer is that it really depends on your crop. Some things like peas and beans, they don't readily cross pollinate. They're more self pollinating and um, even tomatoes to, a, to an extent, um, you can reliably save those seeds and you're probably going to get around the same thing. Um, you're probably going to get relatively the same thing when you plant the, the seeds next year. But there are other crops like the squashes, pumpkins, uh, watermelons, they're insect pollinated and highly variable when you replant them the next year. So that answer really has lots of, that question has lots of answers depending on the variety. So I would get back to that book, Seed to Seed or the Seed Savers Exchange book and um, get a look at that list. And also if you wanted a quick answer, hop on Google and find um, isolation distance charts. Um, I recommend going to a primary resource like a university to get really good information, but they're gonna let you know if you need to space your plants a quarter mile apart or if you can use certain bagging techniques. Um, so there's many answers to that question and I can't dive too, too deep, but I would say um, refer to the experts, get a chart. Um, of course, if you have a specific question, you can always pop it in the comment section and I'll get to it after this video. Thank you. Thank you, Shani. That's very gracious of you. Um, I'm going to move on to watermelon vines. We have Peter asking, my watermelon vines seem to have a fungal disease and the leaves are spotty, curling and drying up. I have several watermelons on the vines. Will they ripen or die off? <laughs> Well, it depends on, that's a good question. And because I don't have a picture, I can't tell you exactly what disease you have. They really range. It could be a mix of diseases. You might have powdery mildew and, you know, like septoria, you could have some uh, mix of diseases, but um, it really depends on if your watermelons are at the far end of the ripening phase or if they're still trying to grow. If your plants need to photosynthesize and ripe and grow those those fruits up and the plants are completely compromised, the leaves are completely compromised, they're really gonna struggle to photosynthesize and you may struggle to get a watermelon. Um, if there is still some healthy leaves and the plant can photosynthesize and finish your watermelon up, you may be okay. So I can't guarantee anything. Um, you can actually drop a picture in the comments section, I believe, or send me an email at seeds at rareseeds.com with some pictures. Um, but that's okay because if you fail completely and your plant dies and you've got these like lame half watermelons um you can always try to get an old pickled watermelon recipe because um pickled watermelon rind was um has been an old timey recipe and it's kind of specifically was devised for um bland flavored watermelons to kind of bring them to life and give them some flavor so um suffice to say i guess what i'm trying to say is there are recipes to utilize that lame underripe watermelon if you fail to get it to maturity. You know, I was recently um, 
reading about watermelons and the history of watermelons. And it's so interesting to think about how uh, different fruits and vegetables have evolved over time to suit, you know, not only the needs of an industry, but also our tastes. And our tastes have gone towards, like you said, <laughs> sort of a blander fruit and also less rind. However, some of those like old, thick skinned um, watermelons that have like tons of great flavor were also prized for their rinds because as you said, they would also like pickle them, right? So it was like getting two kinds of food in one, the sweet fruit and this delicious rind pickle. Yep, and certainly a major lesson that I've learned from studying um, ancient heirloom seeds is that yeah. most of them have multiple uses and that it's only really with the advent of, um, the last few decades that um, folks have taken their food for granted to the level that we do now where we would throw away something like a rind. Right. Uh, so yeah, you are correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's all about um, how people used to save every last scrap, right? And try to use those scraps and turn them into more food, right? Um, yeah, so, so I'm gonna move on to Burley uh, Carrillo perhaps, I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing your names. Um, Burley says, could you please cover best seeds to grow in the desert heat of Las Vegas? So that's a huge question. And there's all different kinds of things that you can grow. But perhaps, you know, I know you have made some really interesting discoveries even this year about some really heat loving crops. Maybe you can talk about some of those. Sure. And I will say that of all the zones, I'm least well versed in de desert. However, there um, there is a really knowledgeable horticulturist on the Baker Creek heirloom expert team named Randall. And he does have expert. Um, he does have experience growing in the desert. So if I don't sufficiently answer this question, please send an email to seeds at rare seeds, attention, Randall or attention, Richard. And those two fellows, they've got more experience in desert gardens. However, I've answered this question many, many times, and I do have my favorites for growing in gar in desert areas. So I uh, and I get a lot of people asking actually about Nevada and about the Las Vegas area. So I, I'm equipped for this question. But if you want more in depth, there's there's a couple team members who know a lot more. But anyways, um, amaranth is my favorite um, green. It's extremely heat tolerant. It's extremely drought tolerant, and it's excellent for um, for the desert southwest. Um, dry beans like the bolita bean or um, some of the pinto beans or black beans, those are excellent for the desert southwest, especially when you go and find maybe one of the um, Native American varieties that are specifically uh, bred for the southwest. Um, certain watermelons are really great for that area. The Art Comey's ancient watermelon would be a great one. Um, some of the Navajo watermelons are excellent. Um, those are kind of my favorite go-tos. I have a whole list. Um, in fact, if you just send us an email, I will send you my extendo list of everything that's good for growing in the desert. Um, but those are my favorites off the top of my head. Oh, and peppers, um, hot peppers, chili peppers do really, really well in that area. So always lean on peppers. And for me, I, um, peppers are one of my favorite um, heirloom crops to grow. So um, definitely peppers are a winner. I'm glad you mentioned peppers. Okay, so I grew um, a few different kinds of peppers this year. And um, I know there is another pepper question that came in in advance about small um, growth on peppers. And um, you and I talked in advance about some of these things and I, I learned something that I didn't know, which probably has happened to some of my peppers, which is a temperature thing. Um, I had um, I'm in zone seven, kind of more the Southern belt. And I had a really hot summer for, you know, at least two months, we were, you know, well above 80 degrees, more than likely in the nineties. And, um, and my peppers have been, you know, really slow, really late. I don't know if I'm ever going to see, you know, fully ripened peppers yet. Um, but uh, maybe you can just uh, quickly talk a little bit because uh, we can dovetail then about um, issues with peppers. <laughs> right. Yeah. So peppers are they're worth the effort, but they can be funky depending on where you are, depending on how you're gardening. Um, peppers, above all, love heat. 
Um, they will struggle, especially with cold um, nighttime temperatures. Getting down below 60 degrees makes a pepper pretty unhappy. Um, and then um, they do, they are fairly heavy feeders depending on the situation. They do really like calcium. They, um, so I like to get my peppers germinated. Just, I'll give you my quick, this is how I grow peppers. I think this is a recipe for success. I germinate my peppers on a heat mat because peppers do like to germinate at around se like 75 degrees Fahrenheit and higher. Um, the high, actually the warmer, the better, especially when we get into the hot peppers. So um, I crank my heat mat up to like 86 degrees Fahrenheit to get them, to get them going quickly. Um, and I, and I usually get my peppers to pop very readily from there. I keep my seed tray pretty well watered. Um, then I bump my pepper seedlings up to a, like a four inch pot indoors. And at that point when my pepper seedlings are about four inches tall, that's when I start to give them some fertilizer and I try to give them a well-balanced kelp based fertilizer to get them started. I want them to have good green growth when they're beginning. Um, eventually I transplant them out. Now, if you are a Northern grower and you're worried about cool weather using a mulch, especially if you're down with using black plastic mulch, maybe the compostable version, if you're working, looking for a more eco-friendly option, but a plastic mulch will help warm the the soil to get your peppers growing but be sure and transplant those peppers out after the soil has really reliably warmed up um heat is really the key with peppers but we want to get them in as soon as we can because we do want the um hot peppers are less of a tricky plant but with bell peppers and sweet peppers if they put their blossoms on and then they get exposed to like above 80 degree weather consistently sometimes it can mess with the formation of the pepper fruit and i bet that's what you ran into and i i think that does happen um often they also do like fairly consistent water this is really addressing more like the bell peppers and the sweet peppers um hot peppers i found are pretty darn resilient um they can to, i found that hot peppers take more heat and they take more um funky water fluctuations but as far as those temperamental like bell peppers and sweet peppers um consistent watering warm soil um getting those blossoms to form fruit before it gets like absurdly triple digits hot um those are kind of keys also they do tend to like calcium and um, potassium in their soil um blossom end rot can be an issue for peppers as well and con more consistent watering and plenty of calcium in the soil are good answers to that issue that's great. Thank you for all of that great information. Um, we also did a an episode of our How Does It Grow show on bell peppers, and there, um, if if anybody hasn't seen that, um, go watch that. There is a wonderful farmer, Bob Muth, who, to him, it's all about the soil and yeah. and feeding those peppers. He is like the only one. He's in Southern Jersey, and he's the only one. I think in the state of Jersey, if I remember correctly, still bringing red bell peppers to market in New Jersey. Most of oh. the farmers are just doing green because it's just so risky and so, you know, difficult in that kind of region to bring, you know, big, beautiful ripe peppers to market. Um, yeah. So um, I'm going to... Um, shoot you one more question, then we can talk a little bit about transitioning the garden. Um, and uh, this one's a bit specific, but maybe we can broaden it out a little bit. Um, Jaw 2808 says, most of my plants in my 10 by five raised bed get a black spot disease. Tomatoes get it the worst. It's happening four years in a row. Do I need to replace my soil um, if, or, um, or can I fix it? I think he meant to say, or can I fix it? I think there's a few things maybe we can broadly talk about. If you have some thoughts on this specific thing, go for it. Um, but I think maybe talking about fungal diseases, um, living in the soil, and also perhaps, you know, I'm, I'm wondering if it's an overcrowding situation, you know, when you don't have really good airflow and you only have this, you know, one raised bed and you're trying to grow as much as possible. I know that feeling <laughs> and, and maybe spacing is an issue, but what do you think? What do you think, Shen? I think that there are some cultural practices we can do before we resort to any kind of chemical treatment. Um, 
first of all, disease does build up in the soil year after year, and it is always recommended that you rotate out, especially your tomatoes and all your solanaceous crops. If this gardener can hold off for a season and grow something in a totally different plant family to give the soil a rest, that would be awesome. Like if they could do peas I, or a legume of some kind, um, just do or a green or a cover crop even, um, that would be tremendous to give the soil a rest and let those, that's got to stop building up. Again, you are totally on point that um, airflow is really a major contributing factor to fungal disease. So adequately spacing our tomato plants is key. Um, my dad, this season, he packed his tomato plants in so closely because I was out of town and wouldn't, wasn't able to stop him. My sister was like, oh, he's putting them in too close. I came home and <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. It's a, it, it's a mistake we all make. I'm guilty too. You just want to totally, but anyways, Okay, if you got to get a few more tomatoes in, then prune that foliage to really open up the airflow. But we need airflow. We want to try to water our plants right at the base, right at the root zone, and not watering the foliage if we can help it, because that's also going to create an airflow issue. So we're going to try to increase our airflow. We're going to keep that foliage dry, and we are going to try and see if we can hold off and rotate out, because... Yeah, if you just keep planting the solanaceous crops over and over, specifically those tomatoes, you're, you are building up disease in the soil. So, And I want to specifically speak to the disease that he has, but to be honest, a lot of them look the same, and I really would need a picture. And um, send me, again, send me an email with the, with the pics, and I can get you a better answer, more detailed, but that's what I've got. That's great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And actually, what uh, let me pick up on what you mentioned, which is a cover crop. So that might be a good segue to talking about transitioning the garden. If you are not planting a fall or winter garden, how do you put your summer garden to bed so that you are setting yourself up for success next year? What, do you have any pointers? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so putting your garden to bed really is how you do it is going to depend on your preferences, your needs, your preferences, your soil needs. So um, for this gardener right here with that specific problem with the tomatoes, let's go back to him or her. Um, if I were you, I would hold back on trying any fall edible crops, cash crops, and I would actually try a cover crop because you're really looking for soil maintenance. And if if you're someone who's feeling like their soil could use a refresher or use some work, you may want to hold off on much of um, a cash crop planting and, and try a cover crop. Um, because if you pull your crops out a little bit earlier, then you might, some, some of us, I myself included, sometimes we leave our crops in all winter and we clear out in um, the next, the following spring. But if you pull out your crops and you sow a cover crop in time for it to start getting germinated before um, you get cold for the winter, uh, that can be beneficial to you. And you can choose your cover crops depending on what your soil needs. For instance, if you have heavily compacted soil and you want to aerate it, you may consider a daikon radish cover crop that's something you'd want to get in sooner than later because daikon radish isn't going to go growing for you in the middle of the winter. Um, if you're a little late to the game, but you still want to get a cover crop in, Austrian winter pea is a great late, you know, get it in late game kind of crop. Um, I live in a coastal area, so one of my key things that I do when I close down for the season is I will pull my plants out. Um, now, let me just say, there will be some people here that think that do not like to pull their their garden they don't like to pull the old plants out for the season because they like to leave things for wildlife and that's totally cool and i'm down with your version of that's cool too because birds and winter animals um winter visiting animals will enjoy your leftover plants and that's fine but if someone's dealing with like a disease issue um and they've got like leftover plant detritus that's diseasey get it out and then um you don't want to let your, your soil just sit barren all winter, um, you know, losing a layer of topsoil and getting eroded. So there are things you can do, like I said, cover crop. But I also, being coastal, I put a layer of seaweed on my garden every season and a layer of horse manure. I, But um, 
you don't have to go. Wait, there. where do you get seaweed? Where do you get seaweed? Like actual strips of seaweed? Yeah. Um, I am a New Englander, so I go out. Um, I go out and I harvest seaweed off the beach because it's like my legal right to access. That's the amazing. <laughs> and um, it's your legal right too. Um, <laughs> we have access rights on the coast. Uh, specifically f because throughout history, farmers have needed to access the beach um, in an equitable manner to harvest seaweed to put on their fields. Now, if you have an issue where it's not um, legal to harvest it or you're worried about contamination or something, seaweed might not be the choice for you, but that's okay because there are lots of other things we can put on our garden for the winter. You can cover it with clean straw. You can put down a layer of compost. There are lots of options, but I do recommend putting something down just to um, protect that beautiful top layer of soil because it's oh so important. And uh, because of the because of the microbes that are in there, we're trying to protect them, right? We, we yeah, don't have the sun. What's soil food web? Of this beautiful, beautiful food web, we want to um, nourish and protect, and so that is why I like to do some rotted horse manure or. Um, some seaweed, whatever I can get my paws on. Usually it's just a matter of access. You don't have to worry about going and getting like gold standard seaweed. If you live in Missouri, you may have access to something um, different and just as good. Um, I always recommend, it sounds silly, but like get on like Facebook marketplace and like get into your farmers groups and see who's got what available for free materials, whether someone just did some wood chipping and they've got some free wood chips or like, you know, I'm in Rhode Island, maybe someone's got a bunch of Spartina grass, you know, from the um, bay that I can I can harvest. So there are different things that you can put on your garden and um, it's pretty cool. You just have to use your Yeah, absolutely. I am going to pause and just reintroduce you because um, I know a lot of people have been joining us on a rolling basis. This is, well, I am Nicole Jolly. Welcome uh, to our live stream today. I have a special guest. Shani McCabe, who is a garden expert at Baker Creek Heirloom Seed, who has sponsored our um, home gardening series this season. She has been invited, in advising me every step of the way. <laughs> so every time I have a question, I have been so lucky to just hit up Shani, who um, has, you know, triaged all my questions all along the way. Um, and now I'm, I'm, opening up that wealth of knowledge to you guys by having her here and she's so gracious with her time. Um, I do want to go back to questions. We're taking your questions today. However, I also want to circle back, Shani, to one thing that you were talking about with cover crops, which I think a lot of us new gardeners don't um, realize uh, the role of what a cover crop can do, um, and also uh, the variety of cover crops that are available. Also the timing, I think some of us think, oh God, if I plant something now, is it going to be you know, developed enough and doing what it should be doing to my soil before I have to start planting in the spring? Maybe you can just quickly bring us through some basics about cover crops. Right, um, well, so it really can be dictated by your region that that's going to dictate when you're going to sow your crops and which um, crops specifically you're going to choose. Are you someone who gets a super hard winter? Are you someone who gets a pretty mild winter? Pacific Northwest, maybe you can put some fava beans in for the winter mm -hmm. and um, they'll survive, you know, your kind of mild winter and come out of it. You might even get a, har a harvest or you can turn those beans in. So. Cover cropping, I'm not going to claim it's my exact area of expertise, but I, I do find it very important. And we do have a section on our website on rareseeds.com where you can find the different cover crops listed. Um, what you really want to assess is when you're choosing your cover crop, what you want to assess is first and foremost, what is my projected weather going to look like? And that's going to determine what you can grow. If you're looking, you, so you, if I were a beginner, I would think back to what are my average temperatures month by month? What time am I realistically going to be able to sow my cover crop seed and around what temperature I'm gonna have at that point and for how long will that temperature sustain? Um, 
figuring out the all optimum germination temperature for said crop and figuring, okay, is my, am I going to get four weeks of growth before my frost? Am I going to get eight weeks of growth? Am I not going to get any growth? And I'm sowing my cover crop seed to germinate as soon as it gets warm in the spring. Um, those are important determinations to make. So get you gather your information on what weather you're looking at and how much time you have. Then you're going to look into your ideal germination temperature of the crops you're thinking of. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, and 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 that's you know those are kind of rules that you taught me early on for all of the you know vegetables and fruits that you grow in the year, right? Like that preparation early on. I remember Shani, you really encouraged us to start the series with those like real basics of you know knowing your frost dates and knowing you know the germination times of all your crops like getting all your ducks in a row and that applies here to cover crops as well right absolutely also um another great cheat sheet method is um one depending on your state you have a land grant university and it has yes. a ton of information so please i really encourage people I want to empower people to reach out to your university because you have an extension specialist who is there to help you become a better gardener specific to your area that's great advice i, I i'm sorry to interrupt i use them all the time when i'm researching how does it grow episodes they are my first stop the local um extension agents who you know whose job it is to know all of the issues of that particular crop um and anybody can access them it doesn't have to be a journalist it doesn't have to be a professional gardener the resources are there and a lot of communities even have master gardener programs um and and they'll answer all your questions as well i've used them as well <laughs> i always like to empower folks um to use those resources they're there for us and also always you know reach out to the seed company if you're curious about a variety because we have a, a wealth of information as well <clears throat> so that's yeah. a great, that's a great starting point is just getting your information always keep a garden journal so you can remember oh yeah last february was super you know super mild oh look you're so good um <laughs> little micro pretty specific to you um you also might think about secondary uses of the cover crop if you want to get into that um yeah we don't have to take a deep dive we can yeah. we can move on but that that's that was i think it's it's important for people to think about cover crops. I think, you know, people in agriculture, farmers, you know, we, they think about cover crops and I think it's a really amazing um, opportunity for home gardeners to think about. So I just wanted to, you know, kind of scratch the surface there. Um, there's a quick question, I'll turn back to questions um, that came through and I think it's just good for uh, people to know about this in general. So Kim, um, you, you asked, when tomatoes get blight, can you still eat the fruit? <laughs> it really depends on the condition of the tomato. I mean, I push the envelope. Um, I push the envelope. Um, for me, as long as the tomato isn't like actively rotten, I'll cut away the icky part and just. That's me. Yeah. Off. So yeah, it's up to you. That's a preference thing. Absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, you and I have talked about the sort of the beauty factor of produce and like the beautiful thing of growing your own garden is that you realize how easy it is for uh, a piece of fruit or a vegetable to be, you know, slightly misshapen or a little bit blemished. Things that we would not tolerate if we bought that food from a grocery store. Right. And yeah how you know when it's us who has grown it and you've like put your blood sweat and tears into it we are totally okay with picking that fruit right cutting off a little bit of that you know crack or whatever and eating it and it tastes delicious that is like something that really struck home to me this season you know i was like eating you know like kale with all these kinds of holes in it you know like things that if i had opened a bag from the grocery store i would have been like Oh my God, give me my money back. Yeah. It gave me this new layer of appreciation for how challenging it is 
to farm food, let alone to meet the kind of unrealistic demands that we consumers place on our farmers to grow what shouldn't actually be perfect, right? These these crops, you know, come in all different kinds of shapes and sizes and 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 that's kind of I think for you and I a bit of the fun of it, but we all kind of, you know, have been trained to think of, you know, the shape of a tomato as that like perfect round, not not cracked, red kind of thing. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's what got me super, um, that's what got me super into heirlooms in the first place is like, I'm kind of, um, kind of enamored with the beauty of imperfection. Like I, I love that noise. Like I've always had a soft spot for the beauty and care, like depth of character of imperfection and, um, the diversity of heirlooms. Um, I've always been pretty turned off by like uniformity and perfection. So that's it's why weird. Yeah. Natural, natural attract attractive thing for me with heirlooms is I just I love that. I love imperfect things. They just make they are more attractive to me because they're real. I yes. like that. that's it. It's not like the Disneyfication of food, you know? Yeah, yeah. I like Absolutely. that. Good for all of us mentally like and emotionally actually to to like um to become in love with differences and and flaws and, and reality i think we all could use a reality check with our food so i agree and and piggybacking on your comment about heirloom seeds we've got one from jason grant um he asks can you explain why heirloom seeds are better every big box store has a selection of organic seeds are heirloom seeds a more sustainable product or is it just about seed varieties? All good oh, questions. I like that question. That's a great question. Yeah. So heirloom seeds are um, on many levels more sustainable, um, but not all levels, but I, I believe in on many, many levels um, more sustainable than I would, than you'd say a hybrid, but we don't really need to get into comparing right away. But reasons that we love heirlooms is one, uh, the, one of the most sustainable things about heirlooms is that you will not need to rebuy seeds year after year if you buy heirlooms, because the genetics of an heirloom seed are, are stabilized and they're locked in so that if you make sure that there isn't any wild cross pollinating happening, which in as we discussed at the beginning of the interview, um, is fairly easy to do, to do and to prevent depending on the, the crop, um, you will get the same result if you save those seeds and plant them the next year. That's the whole thing about an heirloom. They're called open pollinated seeds and they, they can be reliably seed saved year after year. There's a little bit of maintenance we do have to do to keep them vigorous and true to type. Um, and once you get into seed saving, you learn the nuances of that. But um, it's a very sustainable way to keep your own seed stock going. The other beautiful thing about heirlooms is that you're really tailoring your seed bank, your own personal seed bank, to your microclimate, which is incredibly important because over the last couple hundred years, the diversity of available seed varieties has diminished significantly. Um, National Geographic put out a really, really stark infographic and it's still available on the web, um, just detailing how tremendously the diversity of heirloom seed varieties available has dwindled. Um, so we're really starting to whittle down to just a, a few main varieties that are available to gardeners and home seed savers. And we lose a lot when we lose that diversity. But um, fortunately, there are programs like Seed Savers Exchange, or there's companies like Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds that are proliferating these rare heirlooms and keeping them in the collective human seed bank by, you know, home gardeners growing them. So, um, for instance, uh, a lot of a lot of modern day um garden seed companies may offer you know five to ten types of red tomato and they're all generally they're sort of they're great they're great but they're generally they grow generally well everywhere whereas um a hundred years ago we may have had um 
we may have had 500 family seed companies across the country, each with their own microclimate specific heirloom tomato. So like we got this rockin' tomato from Georgia and it really performs well in the heat and humidity of the Southeast. Or we've got like this really great Pacific Northwest tomato. Um, and there's so much work that's been done over so many generations to get these varieties to be super specific to a microclimate. And we just don't want to lose that. So if we can tailor our own specific seed banks, we're really getting crops that are like ultra, um, ultra bred for your area. So they're um, resilient to your, you know, specific diseases. They're well adapted to the microbiology going on in your soil and to whatever funky weather patterns you typically get. Um, and that's gold for a farmer. I mean, for a gardener, excuse me. I'm like, isn't that, you know, we're looking for anything we can to help us in the season. Why not look for a variety or varieties that are, you know, that thrive in your region that is like super, super specific, wonderful advice for heirlooms. Mm -hmm. um, also, you know, different flavors, right? I mean, we recently did a, you know, a, a, a video about all the tomatoes that I grew in my garden this year. And I, it's just amazing all the different flavors there are from tomato to tomato. You know, I think a lot of beginning gardeners will, you know, plant, you know, the typical red beef steak or something like that and not realize that there is a whole rainbow of flavor when it comes to any crop really. Um, and, and it's and heirlooms open up the door to that. Uh, you know, you just discover flavors that would otherwise be missing from our lives because you can't get most of this stuff in a grocery store. It's yeah. heartbreaking. It's almost dangerously, you really get down a rabbit hole. I remember when I first got into heirloom seeds, I became like obsessed because I felt like I had been, my uh, door had been opened to a world that I didn't even know existed. I mean, carrots of every color from different cultures with different intended uses, red carrots that are grown to be harvested in Japan around the new year and they're carved into a plum shape and pickled and used in Japanese New Year's recipe. Wow. To purple carrots that are grown in the Swiss Alps and are um, typically pickled to deep purple carrots from Turkey and the Mediterranean that are packed with antioxidants. Um, they yeah. have a specific story. Each culture has put its, its fingerprint, its thumbprint on its heirlooms. It's like a source of pride and nourishment. <clears throat> yeah. And it's this amazing way to share history and food and love in a, in a really beautiful way. And I found that it's a really beautiful way to connect and understand another culture deeply. I think I've seen very much firsthand, I've seen folks um, from different backgrounds who will talk about the way that they traditionally use a vegetable and how, oh, that's actually similar. We do it in Poland the same way that they do it in Japan. It's, it's really cool to see how we've co-evolved, you know, specifically used our heirlooms in different ways. and it really shows us how much we truly have in common versus how different everyone is. Absolutely, beautifully said. And I know that that is work that's very personal and important to you. Um, if you, if anybody doesn't know, um, Shani's handle on Instagram at least is Seed Scavenger. And I know you have personal experience traveling the world um, to uncover seeds that maybe back home we have never seen or tasted before. I know it's sort of at the heart of Baker Creek to the founder, Jer Gettle, is, has been doing that his whole life as well. Um, maybe we can just quickly, quickly, can you tell us a story? Does um, one particular experience come to mind of traveling somewhere in the world and encountering you know, a seed that blew your mind or the story behind it that touched you? Sure. Yeah, I um, probably one of my favorite finds and I would never, you know, like I, I don't consider these, you know, my own finds or discoveries. It's more like a sharing experience. Um, 
but um, I grew up with um, one of my best friends in high school. Was uh, her family was from Peru, and it was one of my first really cool experiences having food from other countries. As her family would always share Peruvian dishes with me, and we'd practice Spanish, and it was like honestly, it made my heart swell with excitement when I would go over to the Trujillo family um, house and be invited for dinner. So I did have an opportunity with Baker Creek to go to the Peruvian Amazon and to do some seed collecting. And I found this really fun pepper called um, the Aji Charapita. And it's, I love the way that it was woven into culinary culture and lifestyle. Um, this pepper is commonly found as a house plant in the Peruvian Amazon. And it's also, I saw it in Lima, Peru, in the big city. Um, I saw it pretty much across Peru, except maybe in the highlands. But it's this beautiful mini pepper. It grows pretty much as a bush. And the peppers are only about the size of the tip of your pinky. Wow. Um, super hot. Um, and they're often grown as a house plant. Like um, many people will grow them in a pot indoors. And when they're cooking, they'll just grab a couple peppers. Um, but traditionally what you'll do is you'll take a pepper, you'll take the back of your spoon, you'll crush the pepper and put it. And one pepper will heat your entire bowl of soup. Wow. Um, we brought those seeds back and it, it made me so happy to see uh, they sold really well. They became a, um, a top selling variety. And it made me feel really nice to think that maybe my, you know, it's, um, thinking of families like the, like my friend's family who um, might have stumbled upon that in a seed catalog and said like, oh wow, I, we, that's an old variety from home. I wanna try that out. I had no idea we could grow it up here in the US. And uh, they could have like a nostalgic moment bringing that heirloom back. Um, into yeah, I think, I think, you know, I'd just like to ask you to maybe flesh out um, the idea of, I think some people might have concerns about, you know, <laughs> like historically feeling like colonists, right? Going out into the world and discovering seeds, you know, when we, you know, haven't discovered them. They've been used um, by the population in that country for a very long time. How do we square um, taking seeds from one place in the world and bringing them to another? How do you feel about that? Right, that's, right. that's really, really important is there has to be uh, reverence and respect for those, those, yes. those best, best seeds. Yes. Um, and there's many ways that you can go about that. Well, first of all, it's always important when I'm writing a description to give credit to whomever um, originally you know, bred that seed or created that variety or stewarded those seeds. Um, there are things we can do with, like just as the company, there are things that we've done in the past with um, working to um, send a portion of the profits to a good um, a project that goes back into that specific community. There are different ways that we will work that um, depending. And, but mostly it's really about giving reverence and respect to whomever, um, to wherever those seeds came from in the description and making sure that that history is passed on. Maybe sometimes I'll include like links and information to um, further information if people want to learn about oh, who are the um, Uyghur people of China? I want to know more about, you know, this seed that came from there. And I want to know more about those folks. So oftentimes um, when someone opens up the Baker Creek catalog or the seed catalog, exchange catalog or any other catalog, seed catalog that has international varieties, um, they will also end up kind of going down a history rabbit hole and learning about, about a culture or peoples or a place that they hadn't known about before and and end up finding out some really interesting information and yeah, develop that's, a deeper level of respect and understanding. Yeah, understanding. That's beautifully said. That's exactly the excitement I get from <laughs> at least the Baker Creek catalog. I love, you know, anybody who watches this channel knows that I love to get at the story behind the food. What is the origin story? How did we come to eat what we eat? And Baker Creek is so awesome in doing that same thing. In fact, you, Shani, 
um, write a uh, wonderful video series that Baker Creek does called Seed Stories, um, which you guys should all check out. Um, and they kind of take the deep dive into one of the varieties that you can actually get from them, um, which I love. It's it's a very a common interest that we have, our channels have. and. Um, to that, I just want to piggyback on that and say that there is a commenter, um, Obama Gardner says, um, how is BC, uh, sorry, how is BC seed supply going to be for 2021? And I know that a lot of people um, have left comments below my videos like, oh my God, I, the varieties you've talked about, I've gone to the website and it says sold out. So maybe you can just talk quickly about the seed supply. Cool. Okay, I will. One thing I'm going to jump back to, um, Seed Stories, which is an amazing series, is at this point predominantly written by for a while, predominantly written and, and created by Michelle um, Johnson, who I work with um, at Baker Creek. And so um, she- Can I just pause and say she okay. is a total okay. rock star. She okay. is a, an amazing journalist. I have had the privilege to be working with her too through this series. Shout out to Michelle Johnson. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I, I do work on seed stores as well, but late, uh, in, for the last oof, two years now, she's really been pretty much doing all of it. And I love watching them and um, I, I work with her, but it's been amazing. And she's really mostly the brains and getting it done. And I highly recommend folks check that out. Um, your question about 2021. Um, so um, there's been overall pressure on the seed supply due to COVID, um, but we've been on top of it. We, we pretty much foresaw, pretty much as soon as COVID started, we, we saw, okay, this is going to affect the seed supply. So we were um, as ahead of it as we could be. And I don't foresee we're going to have the shortages we had in 2020. I think we're going to be just fine. Um, but my, always my recommendation is just to keep an eye on the rare seeds website um consistency with being on the site and kind of checking out when things come back in stock is is important and um which is totally cool because the rare seeds website has a lot of um fresh content that gets put up and new varieties get thrown up there so it's worth it. yeah absolutely yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and and to um just elaborate on the whole COVID 19 thing um I don't know if everybody knows, but there was a big boom this year in home gardening because yeah. maybe it's yeah. you, right? You are a first time gardener um, who, uh, you know, thought, you know, this is a great time. We're all home <laughs> to, to, to create the garden of our dreams. Um, so uh, th to that effect, we started the home garden series as a way to help out first time gardeners. If you guys go back and watch that home garden series, you'll see sort of a wealth of foundational knowledge um, for starting a garden. And of course, on Baker Creek's own channel, you are constantly doing videos. You will see Shani in those videos, bringing you guys through month by month and crop by crop. Um, so definitely check that out as well. I'm looking at the time. We only have 10 minutes. So I'm going to just jump back to a few more um, qu questions that came in. Um, and we're going to try to blow through these really quickly. Um, so one is, let me just find it. I'm sorry. Um, there is, sorry, I'm just scrolling up guys. Bear with me here. Squash beetles. Is there a companion, sorry, a companion plant to deter these pests? That's from Ben H. Um, I don't typically use companion plants for squash bugs. Um, what I typically do is plant the season to avoid the peak of squash bug season so um but that's really that that option is available more to people with long seasons um if you're way up north it's a little harder to avoid squash bug peak population um but like say in missouri at our gardens that's our go-to technique is we plant our squash in, in july just to avoid the june peak for squash bugs um Trap crops can work as well, but you really got to time those expertly. Um, some folks will use a netting. Um, they'll kind of use like a mesh netting, but um, you want to really be on top of that and make sure that you get it on early in the season. And then you're going to run into, you know, some technique issues with pollination. So squash bugs are a challenge. Yeah, challenge. Yes. 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 
way. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, they kind of get everyone, I think, <laughs> in the end, right? Um, okay, I um, just saw, I keep losing my questions. Um, sorry, well, I know that there was somebody who was talking, I think it came in earlier about aphids. Um, I know for me, aphids were sort of an issue um, in the beginning when the plants were very young, but I have found that most of my plants, when they mature, aphids aren't that big of a problem. Usually by then, um, some of those beneficial insects have come in and started taking care of the situation for me. But I remember um, there was a comment who came in specifically about zucchini and aphids. Was there anything you wanted to say about that? Right. Um, right. Well, applying diatomaceous earth before the plants bloom, that is a way, like if you're looking, if you, and it really is like determining how, how heavy your aphid infestation typically is. Encouraging beneficial insects. Um, I don't really love suggesting spraying too much because you don't want to get your beneficial insects with whatever you're applying. But if you would really like to apply something, diatomaceous earth is fairly innocuous. And I would just be sure to plant it before the, the or to apply it before the plants bloom. So that's more on the early foliage. Um, but um, releasing lace wings and lady beetle larvae are a good way to um, get some beneficial insects in there. Also, um, inter companion planting with things like nasturtiums and other uh, beneficial insect promoting plants um to really get the biodiversity going to keep the aphid uh, population down that's another way that's great and i want to hit one more question because it also dovetails with something that i'm experiencing too um shadow fauna says my question how do i plan for my fall crop when we are still experiencing extreme weather swings here in ohio we are currently experiencing 90 degrees and we'll only have 50 days before our first frost. So similarly, I'm still having really hot weather here and I've been able to take out a few of the plants that have like pooped out, but a lot is still thriving. And I'm like, you know, I'm in between, um, you know, knowing when to pull out, when to plant out. Um, so maybe that's a secondary question as well um, to shadow faunas. What do you think? Yes, okay. Yes. okay. That is a common. The Missouri Ozarks were the Baker Creek farm there, and that was a big issue. Um, going from extreme hot to extreme cold really quickly, um, only having like this teeny tiny little fall window. There are ways to mitigate that extreme um, scenario. One is starting things indoors and transplanting out. That's a big one. That's a big important one. Um, indoor, it's just like when you're starting things in spring in the north and you need to protect them from the cold. We're doing the same thing. We're starting our seeds indoors, maybe in the AC or just in a shaded area, the coolest area possible. We're keeping our, our trays well watered, consistent watering, deep watering is really important. When we're talking about planting in the heat of the summer, we can actually plant our seeds a little bit deeper because the soil's a little cooler, deeper down, um, and they'll still germinate. So we're planting a little bit deeper. We're deeply and consistently watering. We are starting indoors and transplanting out we are identifying our shadiest and coolest microclimates in the garden. Like maybe you have an old sunflower and it's still casting or a wall of sunflowers and it's casting some good shade. Leave them in while you're getting those uh, lettuce or carrot seeds to germinate because it's going to help actually keep, you know, you could plant your lettuce or your carrots, maybe not directly at the foot of that because you're going to need nice fluffy soil for it. But um, finding your cool microclimates, keeping things well watered. You will probably play with the idea of using season extension methods. Um, I do want to quickly suggest Elliot Coleman's, um, I think it's called the Four Season Gardener. And there's a PDF available for free online, but hop on there and check out what he's got um, as far as recommendations for season extension. That's going to help tremendously. tremendously. Oh, yeah, and, and it's free. Yeah. <laughs> and then we've also got the um a lot of the asian crops um yeah oh it's called i'm sorry it's called a garden for all season garden for all season yep and the principle, yeah. and the principle mentioned is really that we're not extending the growing season through the winter because we know like, at, like when i was up in rhode island 
I know I'm not really going to get things actively growing in the dead of winter. It's just not going to happen even with a bunch of plastic over my plants. But what I can do is utilize all of my active growing time and then protect my floating row cover, some female plastic. And um, what I can do is extend the harvest period because that's really what Pullman really drives home. Drives home. Stop freaking your plants into growth for a time as much as you're actually just keeping them sort of in suspended animation as you enjoy the harvest through a longer period. So, okay. so. check out the PDF. Um, I, Jared Gettle has really opened my eyes and he's the owner and founder of Baker Creek. He's really opened my eyes to some of the beautiful Asian crops that are really, really they're, they're really versatile in that they can take extreme heat and extreme cold. So um, if you've got to make yourself a little list of fall planted crops, I would not, not food, um, tot soy, kizuna, um, those things are great, cold and hot. Um, try to get some carrots in there if you can. Pea shoots are a great one and you could even use a spray. Um, spinach is a great one because it can take a lot of cold. Um, but yeah, there's a, that's a deep dive we can go into for ever. I love Absolutely. It. And I'm glad you mentioned the Asian crops because that is, um, I have a whole bed dedicated to, um, like you said, tatsoi and different colored bok choys and Chinese broccoli and celery, all of the ones, um, and they're all so beautiful. There's purple bok choy and pink celery and all of that stuff. So um, I'll be doing a, an Asian vegetable um, video coming up this fall. Fingers crossed that all of that comes up beautifully. I had such an amazing um, success with germination on our seeds this year. So I'm, I am very confident. <laughs> Thank you, Baker Creek. Um, but I, I, I am gonna wrap this up. Shani, thank you so much for your time. I think we learned so much um, with you and I'm so glad people got to hear from you um, as I have been this whole season. Thank you for, for all that you've done to help our uh, home gardening series here at True Food TV. Oh, um, everybody you. check out Baker Creek's um, channel is uh, Rare Seeds, that's their handle. Um, go back and check out our home gardening series, which we'll be continuing on. Um, we also do uh, a series called How Does It Grow? where we take a deep dive into a single food and look at how it's grown on the commercial level from the agriculture side. And we really go deep into um, big agriculture themes, but in really digestible um, sort of origin stories. So thank you everybody for joining us. I hope to see you guys again soon. Maybe I can rope Shani uh, back into joining me again. Um, have a great day guys. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>